Okay, welcome everyone to the Deep Dive podcast. We are super, super excited to be having this podcast today. We've got Kim here from Belvista Studios and our awesome special guest, Kirsty from School of Facilitation. And I'm Hannah from Belvista Studios. Um, so today we really would love to have a chat about putting your user at the heart of your design. So basically how we got to this stage is Kim and I were putting out stuff on social media. So things that we're interested in, projects that we're working on. And the awesome Kirsty approached us and saw that we were posting about putting our user at the heart of our design. And she basically said that she had been doing it too through her business. She's really interested in the topic and basically we got chatting about it and we started having some really awesome conversations and we thought what a better way to give back to our community than to record these conversations and hopefully add value to you and your work and show you why putting your user at the heart of the design is so awesome. So thank you Kim and Kirsty, for being here today to discuss this topic. Um, <sighs> So to get started, it would be awesome to hear from both of you why you believe putting your user at the heart of the design is so important. So we'll get started with you, Kirsty. Why is it important okay. for your business? So um, I do a lot of, well, majority of all my <laughs> workshops are face-to-face. -face. So that's the difference between a Bell Vista and School of Facilitation. I think that we do the face-to-face. -face. You guys do a lot of awesome online work. Um, and I've been in, I guess, L&D or capability for the last 12 years. And I got taught really, really early on about actually it's not about you, the facilitator. It's not about the business. It's about the, the learner and how important it is that when you're in those learning situations that you really take into consideration what it is the people in the room need, not my comfort, not what the business outcomes are. Um, so that's where I started. And what was the question again? I've lost it already. <laughs> uh, so just like the importance, so why you believe putting... Um, well, think about it. Um, I think a lot of us, if you go back to when you were at school, um, sometimes it didn't feel like it was about you in the classroom. It was often about the teacher getting the messages over. It was about the school hitting their objectives to be able to say they taught you X number of hours and it was to get you through your exams. Um, and what you find is when adults come back into a learning space, sometimes they kick back into that old way of thinking. And um, they, I have seen grown men behave like teenagers, stroppy, whatever. But if you put the responsibility, the ownership, and you create really great engagement, and you put the group at the heart of everything you're doing, you get them to come on the journey with you because they want to, not because they've been told they have to. So therefore, it's I just find it makes for a better learning experience and so people are more likely to start to engage with the content, remember the content, um, utilize the content and what they've learned. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I really like that um, about engaging them, that whole buy-in. They're so, I feel like they become very proud of the solution. They're really attached to it. They want to see the success. And I think that's something that I've enjoyed being a part of. Yeah, and, and it's how we, it's part of the design, but then it's also in, and I'd be interested to know what it is from your perspective, but when I'm delivering, so when I'm in the workshop, I know it then is also about my language, how I set up a room, um, the en energy that we create and the types of exercises to create that engagement, to create that ownership. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how, how does that happen when you're in that online space, that virtual space? To create that engage yeah engagement. i think similar to when you're in the design space but we need to think that what we're designing carries through to that end product because some of the times we can't influence how it's released into the world and what they engage in so by engaging them early on in the process and really understanding their context and their needs that we're able to anticipate things that will come up when they're sitting down six months down the track and engaging with the online solution. So we ask questions like, what makes it difficult? Um, and if it's like time pressure, well, why is that? Is that because your supervisor is hounding down your back or you're not given time to do training? Um, 
So what are those challenges and how can we overcome that? So part of the solution then is not just a little product that we output at the end that sits on internet land and they engage with, but it's recommendations that, you know, supervisors need to, this is just totally made up right now, but if, if your employee is going through this experience, you should allow them a dedicated period of time to do it. These are the things that are going to be covered. Here's a set of questions that you can ask them to kind of check in and understand what they're up to and add, like sound like you, oh, I shouldn't say sound, you should really care about what they're up to. <laughs> but to encourage that kind of connection between two. So the user journey and that human centered design engages people through the whole process so that you create something better so that you do anticipate those kinds of things um, coming up and I think you've touched on a point that I bang on about to my clients is the workshop or the solution we come up with I call it the start of the journey yeah. it's not not the fate complete so it, embedding is so important and some customers and clients get that they know that how do you then work with the managers to embed as you just said like what are the coaching questions how do you give time but then there's others who are just like no we just want the workshop and you're like no. yeah well, we but it's like a sticky plaster and it's not going to make ape of the difference so for me i get really passionate also about the embedding journey yeah. and how are you going to support the learners after they've gone through the virtual learning, yeah. the e-learning, the workshop, how are you going to embed the change, the new behaviours, the the new skills yeah. uh, back into the business? Otherwise, thank you, you've paid me some money. That's lovely, but yeah. you're not actually creating the shift that you necessarily wanted. Need. Yeah, that's yeah. something I'm curious of. Um, how do you have those conversations with your clients and? you know, help them yeah. see the light. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> those who know me, and if anyone's watching this who knows me, know that I'm pretty direct and to the point. Um, so I just often use my personal experiences of when I worked at Diageo and when I've worked with other big corporates and explain and share stories of what happens when companies do embed and, and the different tools that are available for embedding. Yeah. like coaching like being clear in line managers and directors kpis objectives for the year that there is an element of this coaching piece yeah um how do you measure um people's shift and transformation um what can you do from a cultural perspective um so we talk i, I will bring it up and just talk about it and then i'll also be really clear if they don't do anything well you'll see a shift probably for maybe a month or two, but then it'll just go back to the way it was. Yeah, so true. I really <laughs> like that true. story side. Um, the stories, I think that's something I need to work on better because I can tell a story, but I feel like it doesn't change any, it doesn't influence them in the way that I want to. Um, but one of the things, oh, you go, sorry. I was gonna say, I think sometimes before we tell the story, it's asking some really great questions to get them starting to connect yeah. with the topic and to think about it from their perspective, their business perspective and their learner's perspective. Yeah. Uh, and then when you tell the story, you can link back to what they've been saying as well. So that's called influencing or selling, however you want to position yeah. it. Um, so it's, and it's timeliness as well, because you know, if someone just came in and you knew that you wanted to buy something from them or you wanted to share an idea and they just sat there and told you a story or told you what you yeah. should do. Often the connection isn't made because you're like, yeah, whatever. So that <laughs> engagement you were just talking yeah. about with learners doesn't occur. Whereas if someone takes time to understand your needs, talks to you, creates a connection, often when, they, when you then hear the story, you're more like to go, uh-huh. Yeah. And you're, you're going to reflect on it. And the other piece I think I've learned more about with my clients is then time. So whilst we as the outsiders can often see what they need to do internally, what would be a really great um, solution. Yeah. They need time to come to that idea themselves, sell it back in, get budgets sorted out. And they're not going to go at the same pace as us. So the other yeah. thing I've started to do is sometimes just step away 
and give them that breathing space. And yeah. whilst that's incredibly, I don't know, for some people frustrating, it's hard, you know, you just want to get on and do because you can <laughs> see their value. If the client's not ready and they're not able to come to the table and, and execute, there's no point in us pushing. We just become yeah. one of those really irritating suppliers yeah. who's forever going, Can we talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> that's just irritating yeah that's my belief think, yeah no it definitely um one of the things that we've been doing recently now is coming in just for a small piece around the ideation and shaping and just getting engaged for that initial consultation where we facilitate the session it's something we would do internally as a team anyway but now we're bringing the clients into the conversation because then they, when they start to go, what about this? What about this? And wouldn't we, that's when that buy-in is really awesome. And they start to see that transfer of learning and yes, we need the supervisors to take on this responsibility. And then this is what the employee should be doing. And I feel like that's had a big impact on solutions that we design, having a better impact out, for the user, the business itself, and all those kinds of return on investment things. Um, so bringing them in on that process. And it's, as well as the, we talk about uh, human-centered design and the end user, but they're also our end users. They're just a different- Absolutely. Yeah. Two things that went in my head then. One is, I think it's really helpful for the client if you paint the picture of a potential complete journey. So what would gold yeah. standard look like? So from your perspective, you know, ideation, design and Q, you know, testing, um, back into checking you know, and then delivery and then the embedding piece. Now, yeah. whether they take the full solution is another matter. But I think if you can paint best practice, it allows them to see possibility and therefore they can then... It's like a shopping they, list. Yeah, we can do yeah. this now. That'll be phase yeah. two. Yeah. And, and then the other thing you just said, um, back to the humans at the heart of learning one thing i'm really clear that i do is when i'm writing the um objectives and outcomes for a piece of learning i will stand in the shoes of the learner stand in the shoes of the business mm. and, and the stakeholder um, and be really clear because sometimes businesses come to you and go we need and when they say we they mean them, their business we yeah. need to do this. and then i'm like okay but what do the learners need yeah so sometimes we have to be in those conversations, the champion of those learners, not yeah. just their business. So uh, at the beginning, so at the moment, uh, I've had it on the floor, I often write purpose and outcomes for any workshop or event. And then as I go through my design, I'm creating purpose and outcomes for every single big block of yeah. the, the session and the learning so that I can refer back to it and go, okay, is what I'm designing meeting that purpose and those outcomes? Yeah. Yeah. How do you get to those purpose and outcomes? Mm. I think about them. <laughs> <laughs> Not like, how you, like how do you, when you say you like step in the shoes of the end user yeah. and really like endure them and think about like what you would need as a user, how does that information come to you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Uh, is it through conversations with like the business or do they speak to the end user or? Do you know, I was thinking about this because when I was reading your questions, Hannah, that you sent over earlier, I was like, do I do this enough or am I going on my own personal experiences? Mm -hmm. So I came to two, a couple of conclusions. One, when I'm designing for, I do a lot of commercial and sales work because that's my background. So I often just revert back to me. And what was yeah. it like for me when I was sitting in that classroom? So there's, there's that element. I then realized though, when I'm doing a lot of the facilitation training, I, I do it in the moment. So whilst I start with a set of outcomes, I'm then in the moment with the group, really noticing what do they need? Because we always do an outcome session at the beginning of day one. Yep. Yeah. So I can really gauge what is it they need. And then we also do a challenges. So I'm always looking at their challenges and therefore whilst the agenda is normally a good 70% right, I know I can totally adjust yeah. and change what it is we need. So yeah. that's, those are the two places. So sometimes it's before and sometimes it's in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it sounds like you've got like really awesome skills at assessing the group that you're in 
and at the beginning of sessions really understanding what their needs are like you've got that ability to check in with them and not just deliver content thinking yeah like I, it's, 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 haven't like, you had that experience yourselves where it, but have you not had that experience yourselves where you go to a session and you just think but we've told you what we need and we've told you what our challenges are or yeah. and then it just goes in totally a different direction and you're yeah. like yeah. <laughs> what's the point of that then yeah. like, this isn't useful for me <laughs> exactly so what do you guys do to get to um purpose outcomes when you're in that design phase uh well i think a big thing for us is like we always talk about it but kathy moore's action mapping and that like we get told we need empathy training for customer service and we're like okay well what does empathy look like you know and i think the big thing about that is for us it's about okay scrap everything blank canvas if we were to see someone do something if you were a fly on the wall what would you physically see them do because that's what you can train so like empathy i don't know if you guys are empathetic but right now kirsty like you you look like you're listening right <laughs> you're not speaking um, you look like it. <laughs> so there's certain cues that you can pick up on that okay well she it doesn't look like she's too distracted right now she's not fiddling on her phone and stuff like that she's waiting until i finish talking so the, yeah, they're the yeah. things that they're the behaviors that we can see and then we basically drop that down what's something we can see if you're a fly in the wall and we write them all down we'd see this we'd see this we'd see this okay cool what order would they happen if the highest performer the best employee the best person did it how would that look and what order would they do it in and that yeah. brings you on a journey and like right now we don't have learning objectives but we start to get tangible things that we need to train which then after yeah. time allow us to pull out themes um and then it's about yeah what what makes it hard so why is it not happening now um why is it hard for people and you look at it from four different lenses so is there knowledge missing is there skills missing do they not have the motivation or is the environment wrong for it so environment stuff is a lot around that cultural side of things um and i think that shapes then that basically writes the training content for us wow, and okay of themes understanding well they need to do this this and this okay yep. what does that look like and then it's kind of like you go all the way out there and then you're able to rein it back in so I'd, i don't i have to say in like the time that i've been doing it i have not been i have never written a learning objective list for a course yeah whether that's right or wrong but no. the clients know now <laughs> well, not well like, you, like it's making it realistic like i love how even like for example if you think of like a multiple choice question in an online quiz rather than like some courses can be like really obvious incorrect answers where it's like no person would ever think that was the correct <laughs> answer it doesn't add value to your learning at all yeah but with the action i think like it's about picking out options where people are actually doing that so they'll see it and be like oh like i do that every day and yeah. it's not necessarily the right behavior but it makes it really realistic for them yeah like it's not just coming up with like oh we need to teach them this so we'll give them the correct answer and these silly answers like it's actual behaviors that are happening yeah how can we replicate the real world so that they have a space in the yeah. online environment to practice it and therefore yeah. that's like one muscle memory type way of getting them yeah. ready for the real world if we're, not, we're purely talking about that online experience and not transfer of learning strategies yeah um it feels like i wonder what would happen if we both combined those skills so i'll come and write a few and, and when i say learning objectives it's probably just three because you can't cram too much into a session yeah. so and if i utilized your kathy moore's framework just to get my thinking yeah with clarity i reckon that'd be quite a kick-ass yeah of cool on that three thing actually i was i listened to a uh, podcast or webinar recently and they like we're talking about the memory and that literally yeah. we should only be trying to train three things so wow, these 30 minute courses, one day workshops, whatever it is, you need people to remember three things. So <laughs> it's mad. I will, um, 
so have you ever noticed at the end of workshops or you might have an end of a coaching conversation three things you're going to do three actions and yeah. like the brain can remember in chunks of three there's a bit of research done and i'm not going to remember who did it but <laughs> he or she i'm guessing it's a he um did the whole piece around seven plus or minus two pieces of information is what the mm. conscious mind can hold in its head at any one time and wow. and, and if you if anyone challenges you, the way I push back quietly, gently and forcefully is <laughs> um, shopping lists. Yeah. So how many times have you gone to the shop and gone, oh, I need to buy a birthday card, a bottle of champagne, obviously. Um, <laughs> some onions, <laughs> some milk, um, For a person not know, use. And uh, <laughs> but people, people then get into the shop and then, as they're walking out, they often remember the last item. And, and it's I not, can relate. Yeah, yeah, it's something you can't yeah. remember. It's just that our short term memory only holds a finite amount of information. And I think that's why, like the yeah, ATM machines, we only have four digits. Mm. Someone, someone's wife said, I can never remember more than um, four numbers at a time. So, yeah, wow. The power of three, and those awesome guys in America wrote that song of Three is the Magic Number in the 70s. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> do you think then that we should literally just be scrapping everything and just training three things no i think um because the three things we might focus on might mm. not be the three things that the group want so yeah. i think what you can do is you are we know there's only a finite amount of information you can put over in an hour two hours half a day a full day so what you can do is those help the learner identify what it is is most important to them yeah because what what we think is important could be totally different i mean i I, I i kid you not i was doing some work um with an entertainment company and we'd done a three-day sales workshop and at the end i was like like, what's your biggest aha so aha is being light bulbs eureka moments and this guy said put his hand up he went Pressing B on PowerPoint to make my screen go black. Oh, I was like, like, and and again, I'm a very reactive person. I was like, oh, brilliant, that's fantastic. We had just done what I thought was a really good piece of work around (laughs) sales conversations, how to create awesome questions, patient skills, stuff around insights, discovery. And he tells me it's pressing B to make his screen go black. Now, What's he so, trying to hide? <laughs> I, well, yeah. So I was just like, okay, that's fantastic. But so that really showed <laughs> me that what I think is important actually has nothing to do with the outcome. It's what they yeah. think is important. Yeah. So it's back to your question, yeah. should we be scrapping and only doing three things? No, because your three things, the client's three things may not be the what, like the final piece that that learner needs. Mm. Now, yeah. do you need to maybe refine how much you're throwing at people oh yeah, yeah. i don't think we can yeah. cut clothes because otherwise it's too much mm. i've just got a question first you from what you're saying before i'm really interested in understanding this but i know like i've been like around training where management or a business may be wanting people to have a certain training but the people in the room don't want to be there and I'm just thinking like that fitting in with putting the user at the heart of the design. Yeah. Have you ever experienced that? And how did you make the course useful <laughs> for them if they didn't <laughs> believe they needed it? Or is that just something that you can't control? Hmm. Sorry, I'm throwing you a bit of a weird one. Yeah, no, no, I'm just thinking. I am. Um... I, I think I've been pretty lucky in that a lot of the time people have come to the courses because they've wanted to, but I do hear like this is, I, this happens, you know, people get a little bit uppity and you might have one or two people in the room who are sort of sitting there going, I don't need to be here. <laughs> um, so I think it's then down to our language and positioning when we're opening up those sessions um, and checking in with people. Um, and sometimes what I found is people, some people, think they don't need to be there because they know it all already um and therefore if i think that is going on in the room something i say at the beginning of a session is look especially when it's skills Mm. and it's 
and I so I do a lot of skills I have done a lot of skills training especially around selling and I acknowledge that who, who, who is in the room so it's about acknowledging the experience yeah. so you can do a quick adding up of how much experience do we have in the room so I do that first and then I do a piece around look I don't think I'm going to teach you anything new in the next two days three days yet I also know we all form habits um, when we are um, in the workplace and habits are our shortcuts to get things done and having been a salesperson myself I know I will find the quickest easiest simplest route to a solution so my job actually in the next three days isn't to teach you something new it's to help you open up your head have a good look around at these habits and identify one or two things that you could look at to do differently that would help you be more effective when you're in front of your customers. Yeah, I love it. That's and cool. I found just acknowledging what's in the room, respecting that some of those, especially the guys, they've been doing it for a gazillion years, maybe even telling them they're not going to learn anything new, that you just see them relax. But then when we go through the journey, I can see them learning. I can see them going, oh, yeah, you know, the little eyes open up and get the aha and the nodding moment. Yeah. I just think if I hadn't addressed or talked about it at the beginning of the session, they could be making stories up in their heads of, oh, she thinks this, she thinks that. Yeah. But by labeling it and acknowledging it, that's how eases the situation sometimes. Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's what I do. What about you, Kim? Is there anything uh, that we do in the online environment that, like if there is resilience or does the business speak to us about whether the user is actually wanting the development? Yeah, I think in the initial analysis, we find out why do people need to do this and yeah. uncovering that helps us understand the language that needs to be used throughout the training um, to speak to them because I think one of the things like that we are starting to use now in projects is uh, Simon Sinek's Start With Why and like framing the module based around that or the learning experience based around the why. And we identify that with our clients. What is the why? Why does this, what is the purpose and the passion behind this thing? And th that's how it opens. And then it's the how, is it? Yeah. And then it's the why. And yeah. just framing it that way has allowed us to tell better stories up front that resonate because they're uncovered through that. Because we talk to and interview people and ask them questions, you know, about their daily lives. How has this helped? What's a, a struggle that they've had? How have they overcome it? And then we, we show them why this is actually going to benefit their lives so they can see that some people say, what's in it for me? And I think yeah. that's one of the things that's probably working at the moment for us. Um, we are sometimes don't get that much control over it because it kind of happens back in, it depends on how people are assigned that course. A lot of organizations are still in the space of here's your code of conduct. You must do it every three years. So we, it's only the proactive ones and the ones that are actually not trying to tick a box that will engage us to really understand how can we get managers and supervisors on board to have the right conversations around why this is important, why we do it, all that kind of stuff. But that's the same. So you talk about Simon Sinek's why that's my purpose and outcomes. And by having those conversations up front yeah. with the business, you can get clarity. Like, why are you doing this? Um, yeah. Why is this important to your business? Um, the what's in it for me or W I I. FM, what's in it? <laughs> and then WIIFB, what's in it for the business? Yeah, so those are those are the those are the shoes that I stand in. So yeah. I think we're we're saying the same thing. We just have different language. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's important. And getting the businesses that we work with to recognise why are they doing this? Like, yeah, sometimes helping them understand that because they come to you with all passion and enthusiasm, but you can just feel like they just want to talk about the what they need and how they're going to do it. But you can yeah. just step backwards and go, but why? Why is that important yeah. to you? What is and that that's what's cool about? is because I think uh, like we HR people, learning and development people are our clients. So that's who we work with, who traditionally are people that care, 
you know, they want to help other people improve and be better. I know that's why I was attracted to this industry. Um, and being able to have these conversations allows them to come out of that state of, I need to get a project done. I just need Belvista Studios to do it. To when you have those conversations, they start to think about, this is why I got into that career. I care about these people. And they, they, get, they tap into that intrinsic motivation themselves. And then, yeah, that's pretty cool. Definitely. What else, Hannah? So for our listeners who are listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. if you were to tell them why, um, like what the benefits you have seen with user design. So if they're yep. listening and they're like, oh, like it sort of sounds cool, but like, why should I do it? And like, what benefits do you have that would make them want to be like, I really want to give this a shot? What would you say to our listeners? Okay. Um, I think one thing, no, no order of priority, but the projects that we do <laughs> that with are freaking awesome to work on. You know that they're having an impact out in the world and it's so like motivating. I feel I can feel now I feel proud to be a part of those projects and put them out into the world. Um, when you do the user testing and you're asking people along the journey, how does this work? Does it make sense? All those kinds of things. They give you feedback that really, you know, they've had an epiphany moment or they see the value in it. And I think, when you have yeah. they become champions then out there um you create better solutions the questions that you use through the interviewing techniques the ideation that you do all those things to come up with like divergent converging convergent mindsets they allow you to come up with solutions that are effective and also yeah. that it's it's like, I feel like, I don't know, I never wrote, oh, in my early career, it was like, here's a PowerPoint, go Google, everything to do with communication, for example. And you're like, write a course like that. And you're just like, fill the screens. <laughs> but I feel like when you put the users through, I didn't have a good teacher. Um, <laughs> I didn't know any better, all right? Um, and then I think now when you do put the, them there and those benefits, you write content, they tell you what they need to know. And through our expertise, we're able to then flip it around and share it in a way that makes sense to them. Yeah. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Kirsty? Yeah. Say the question again, Hannah. Oh, the benefits. Um, I, I, this might sound really trite, but I've never had any other way of designing. So I was taught from the off. Oh no, I, w I experienced my learning as this way of working, i.e. we were at the heart of the learning and it felt really different. So there was so much engagement, ownership given over to us in the sessions that that's just the norm for me. So when yeah. it came to then me stepping into this world and starting more design and then delivery and becoming more consciously aware of how it all sticks together, yeah, it was just like, well, why would you do it any other way? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't understand that people would do learning where it was about them as the facilitator or trainer or, you know, it was their show. I yeah. couldn't understand it. And I had a really great teacher, a man called Tim Andrews, and he talks about where's your spotlight. And he says sometimes, in, I think it's more old world, but, you know, a lot of facilitators and trainers, the spotlight was on them. Mm. So how we showed up. Yeah. How good are we? Yeah. <laughs> learner. Yeah. So I've seen both and um, just seeing the learners go, oh yeah, I get it. And, and, and have their personal ahas. And then also where I've had the privilege to have like ongoing learning journeys um, happen in businesses and I've been able to go back and I've seen the shift and I've heard people say tangibly, when I was working with my customers, we were able to get to an agreement quicker or we cut three months out of the negotiation process because we could sell more effectively. Yeah. My God, that's when I get all giddy. And I know yeah. it's such a small thing, but it's like, yeah. So those three days you spent with us made all that difference and saved your business, saved your business money, saved yeah. you heartache, and you've got yeah. a happy customer and you're getting to solutions way quicker. So that's the benefits for me. That's cool. What about you, Hannah? It's so true, like we're designing for the end user, so there's no, like, why would you do it any other way? Like, it needs to work for them. 
and it just makes me think of like I know we've spoken about it Kim where for example designing it's like a lot to do with the action mapping where designing training is so like a training course is introduced and training is not actually required <laughs> so like an example is like people might not be wearing PPE so a whole course is designed because the business is like oh we need to show people the importance of PPE blah 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 and it ends up being there's not enough PPE for people to wear. So the end user's like, why? Like, I know the importance, but there's not enough PPE there for What's us. What's PPE, to... Hannah? Uh, personal not... protective equipment. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. Just an but example. They might like, not yeah, wear boots that, like, when they go out on site, but they're like, well, I was never given boots. So. <laughs> yeah. So, like, the business may think, oh, like, people need to understand the importance when really, like, training's not needed, it's just resources. Like yeah. it could be something completely different so but then yeah, it just shows me, the importance of like really understanding your end user because it can yeah. have such a big impact and you can waste so much time but i think so it also in that example hannah as well sometimes businesses come to you and say they need a bit of training or a bit of learning but actually what we also need to do is take them back up into their own business strategy and say what is it you're looking to achieve this year mm. like what are the shifts you need to create what are your business goals because again, yeah. sometimes that's the disconnect when people are seeking that learning is they've done a bit of research around the business and half the managers have said, oh yes, our people need presentation skills. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, we need to be better at yeah. negotiating. But when you dig under the surface and say, where does that come from? Often yeah. it's just a, oh, it feels like a gut instinct versus, now gut instinct's good, and I talk about that a lot. Yeah. I think that it needs to be evidenced especially where you're working in businesses and you'd say to them okay so what's your business strategy for the year what are you looking to achieve um what um gap analysis have you done yep. for your people so where have you done your own research so is there a genuine need for this piece of learning because I, I, and i also say yep. to the clients i don't want you to be spending money when there isn't a need and yep. they sometimes go what and then the other thing I talk about is, you know, giving them the learning and giving them the content or the skills to be able to deliver it themselves. I'm like, I don't want to be in your business in a year's time. You can do this yourself. You're perfectly capable. Yeah. But um, that's a whole other conversation, isn't it? Like, <laughs> transferring the knowledge and giving it to them. <laughs> it's true. Okay. So on the topic of when we're talking about having three things, three takeaways that we can often keep in our mind as learners. Yep. To finish the podcast, how about both of you give our listeners three takeaways for applying um, like user design, so putting your user at the heart of your design. And you yeah. have to give three as well, Hannah, I reckon. <laughs> oh, they're all the same. I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> oh, fuck, we better go first then. <laughs> um, okay, three things. Three things, uh, Google either Stanford D School or IDEO and go watch the introductory video on human-centered design. That's one. <laughs> okay, we got eight more to go. <laughs> I'll add one, one each. Yeah, go. Um, I would really encourage you uh, when you're talking to your clients to listen to what they're saying. And are they talking about the need coming from them as a business or from a learner perspective? And if whichever one's missing, inquire around it and get, like it. get really clear what's in it for the business, Yeah. what's in it for the learner. Yeah, cool. Nice. Okay, beat that, Hannah. <laughs> the beating is about adding, Kim. Okay. So and value. <laughs> So this is you're right, Kim. If we all give one, we've got the three takeaways. Yeah, that's definitely the one to go. Okay, so we're just waiting on you, mate. <laughs> um, I would say, from what I've learned about user design, I would say that when you're designing a course or having those initial conversations about what content should be included and how it will look, yeah, I would say to a hundred percent. If you're having like a face-to-face -face meeting or whatever however it may look include some of the end users in that conversation so have them there in the room because you can as the business and as say you're the instructional designer or the facilitator you can come up with so many different assumptions around what you think people need but if you have 
a variety of those users in the room that could tell you things that you would never even know that could completely change the yeah. direction of your course or your training session. So, yeah, I would say yeah. have the end cases in the process, embed them into your process. And yeah. And I'd go one step further with that, Hannah, which is if you are doing something that's, well, if I, I stand it back in my old world of um, sales. Um, if you can actually physically go out and observe oh, yeah. action doing what they need uh, to do, yeah. that gives you so much rich information because you can yeah. observe what's happening in the now, you can hear language, you sense the business's culture, you can see interactions, you can see processes, you can see behavior, and it just gives yeah. you such awesomeness that you can then start applying it into the design and especially as examples um and it helps you learn about a business as well so you can be really i think connected to them and bring more even more value love it love it all right does anyone else have anything to add before finishing up um um kim can you say where we could find the is it kathy moore's yeah, if you Google Kathy Moore action mapping, it's like the first thing that comes up anytime I Google it anyway it is. Um, she's got a <laughs> blog, it's awesome. She does a slide share that talks about actions and behaviours and then pulls it right back to what's the information and resources so that you know what's important to put in your course and what's not. So there's a slide share on Kathy Moore action mapping. Um, yeah. And is it Kathy with a K, a C, and C -A -T -H -Y -M -O -O -R -E. is it more? C-A-T-H-Y-M-O-O-R-E. Brilliant. Awesome. Based in the UK. Oh, she would go and find ladies. Her, <laughs> you can find her, Hannah. Yeah, you guys can stalk her. her. <laughs> okay, awesome. well, thank you so much, Kirsty and Kim. And thank you especially, Kirsty, for coming as a guest on our podcast. Yay, it's been first awesome. ever guest, mate. That's Very cool. Our passions um so yeah thank you so much for everything and i hope that this added you uh value to all of you as the listeners and we'd love to hear your feedback um if you have any tips for how you um put your user at the heart of the design it'd be awesome to hear that too because we're obviously really interested to continue to learn about it and yeah thank you so much for listening to the deep dive podcast Woo! thanks hannah thanks everyone thanks, hannah.